Um, today we have Chicago-based artist and the graduate program director of um, New Arts Journalism, Dushko Petrovic. Uh, Dushko is the co-founder, along with uh, artist Roger Wright, uh, of Paper Monument, an arts journal that spawned a series of accessible inside read books about the art world. Paper Monument was a non-periodical periodical, and known for giving uh, it's time to put out every issue. Uh, I can't remember if Dushko said every six or 12 or 18 months, I can't remember. Maybe you can talk a little bit about that today. And if you're an artist or are an artist, a special project in, in arts in, in Paper Monument would be a goal to achieve. Uh, Dushko writing can be found at, uh, in the Boston Globe, T, the New York Times style magazine, Book Forum, Art News, and M plus one. His work has been shown at P, Exclamation, Interference Archive, Brooklyn, Soloway, Brooklyn, Kumu Estonia Art Museum. And Dushko is here today to talk about the conditions surrounding a future uh, launch of what he's calling the Daily Gentrifier Flyover Flyer. And this season, How Would You Behave, um, like Donna says, attempts to draw the resonances between various print and matter, the role of the artist as a medium and as methodology, as well as how design emerges out of social, political, pedagogical context. And uh, if you missed the artist talk uh, by Les Levine on Thursday, we're showing two films by Les uh, in the screening uh, area in the gallery. Today we have a, a film from 1974, I Am an Artist, and tomorrow uh, a, night, a film called Analyze Lover, Story of Vincent, uh, where the critic John Perrault plays Vincent Van Gogh. And um, in the audience today as well, it's a uh, New York-based artist and writer, Yin Ho, who is here to write a series of reflections on, on what occurs this season at Beeler Gallery. And that will all be uh, available uh, in a downloadable PDF uh, on the website, which uh, will be launched uh, hopefully soon. Um, I would like to introduce uh, Dushko Petrovic. I have my stash of periodicals up here, which I'll... Thanks so much to Joey and to CCAD for having me. It's a great honor. I, um, as we were talking about a little bit before, I spent my high school years in Bexley and my mom and my stepdad still live here. So um, it's nice to be able to come back and talk about um, my work uh, kind of in one of my hometowns. Um, as Joey was saying, um, I published Paper Monument with Roger White, and I've had um, a long-standing involvement with N Plus One, which was kind of the sister magazine for, for Paper Monument. Um, and I had been doing that, I guess, for around 10 years um, when I decided to found DME. So what I'm going to talk about today is one of the projects um, that's part of DME, um, but I wanted to just first of all mention that it's um, part of a larger rubric of publications and uh, people always ask me what does DME stand for and it stands, I, th I think it's perfect for the show because it stands for um, integrity and transparency in publishing. So um, it's a whole kind of rubric of publications that I've been making and so far, I've uh, made Adjunct Commuter Weekly, which you might have heard of, which is a lifestyle magazine for <laughs> adjunct commuting professors who need to travel around to various schools in order to make a living and survive. Um, and then Adjunct Commuter Weekly collapsed after a week because the adjunct professors didn't have enough time and energy to keep contributing <laughs> uh, to the publication. Uh, so. It was subsequently relaunched as ACW, uh, which was a multimedia platform for a growing and influential demographic, <laughs> um, which can be found at adjunctcommuterweekly.com. So um, UNTER came out of um, 
working on Adjunct Commuter Weekly, and I think it will be an actual app, but for right now, it's just when people ask me what Unter is, I always just say it's the opposite of Uber, and I'm still trying to figure out what that is. Yeah, I think we all are. Like, we're all um, trying to figure out what the opposite of Uber is. Um, <laughs> And then there's uh, the Daily Gentrifier, which I'm going to talk about in some detail today. Privacy Magazine, which I don't talk about publicly. <laughs> uh, Object-Oriented Ontology Illustrated, <laughs> which kind of self-explanatory. Um, stand Up, Stand Up is about um, leftist stand-up comedians. Magazine, Magazine. Um, Actually, it's funny because Magazine Magazine was supposed to be designed by Project Projects, but I don't know those of you guys who are in the in the design world know that Project Projects just split into two design firms. So now I have to figure out like who's going to do it and how it's yeah. I hadn't really thought about that until just now. Um, and then at the top right uh, is Part Ecuadorian, which is a lifestyle magazine for people who are part Ecuadorian as I am, and um, which is a kind of small uh, readership, but um, to compensate for that, there's International Slob, which is a gigantic readership that comprises everything that is not national Slavism. Um, and yeah, I actually have never said this in Ohio, but um, there's another one called Ohio Exile. Uh, which is about people who had to leave Ohio. Uh, so none of you guys have suffered that, or maybe you suffered it and came back. But um, that's that's the that's the DME um, rubric. Um, yeah, and I'm about like 20% of the way through the the ones that that are there. And people think they're jokes. I mean, and I should say something about that. Um, and they are jokes, but they're also actual publications with actual content and actual um, everything that a publication has. So um, before you, before I did the first one, I think people just thought it was a, something I was going to talk about. So <laughs> I'm going to talk about um, Adjunct Commuter Weekly, which is the one that I put out in September, but it's a kind of ongoing thing. And what I what I wanted to do in basic terms was uh, use the aesthetics and yeah, the aesthetics and visual approach of gentrification, but instead of using that to cover up what happens in gentrification, I just wanted to use it to reveal what happens in, gent in gentrification. So in a way, it's a very simple procedure to take the kind of hipster craft, organic, minimalist, 19th century, whatever aesthetic of gentrification, but then put in real content about how that actually happens and who's involved with it and what it does to people. Um, and it is addressed to the gentrifier, uh, as Adjunct Commuter Weekly was addressed to the adjunct commuter. Um, with the adjunct commuter, th that address was partly to relieve them of, of some of their shame about being adjuncts because a lot of adjuncts don't talk about what they're going through because they're ashamed uh, and they think that you know they're going to jump up a level but the system is obviously designed so they don't. Um, with the Daily Gentrifier is a little bit different in the sense that um, it was not built to alleviate shame, it was built to kind of increase and pressurize shame. Uh, to the point where it might transform into some kind of organized political action or something around gentrification. So um, that's kind of the general, like, theoretical overview of it that I have. Um, and at a certain point, I realized that the most, at one point, I, I thought that the, the most hyper artisanal thing to do would be to, to letterpress uh, print uh, the publication. But at a certain point, when I was doing kind of preparatory drawings for the design and things like that, because I'm not an actual designer, I'm like an artist who sometimes designs things, so I have my weird ways of doing things. I was making a drawing and I realized that um, 
I could hand draw the entire publication and that would be the most hyper artisanal over the top way to do uh, the daily gentrifier. So that's what I decided to do. And this is a photo of condo report report, which is probably like this big in real life. Um, and it's a hand drawn uh, little piece and condo report report is a report on a <laughs> condo report as it turns out um, and condo report is a blog that my friend the artist Aaron Gamel does which is a basically like a I think he has a thousand posts or something but they're they're all kind of the same but just reports on like bad condos that are going up in Brooklyn uh, with photos of their anodyne design and construction and it, that's what it is. But Aaron was, was moving to Philadelphia, so I thought it would be funny to report on Aaron moving to Philadelphia and, and leaving Condo Report behind. So I asked Justin Lieberman, who on Facebook goes by Commodore Knabo, or I've never known how you say it, Commodore Knabo or something, to interview Aaron about Condo Report Report and leaving Philadelphia and all these things. But it just very quickly descended into a discussion of Fraggle Rock and uh, like various like Soviet era novels and which ones the Fraggles would be in these communist novels. So they sort of thought that they would get to revise it or change it or something like that. But I had already like hand drawn the whole thing in. <laughs> so I was like, that's the piece. That's it, guys. Like, that's how it's going in. So. Uh, what you see at the top right is a drawing, again, like I hand drew one of Aaron's pieces. Which he does these great prints called viewing panels where he goes up to those plexiglass viewing panels that they have at construction sites in New York and uh, pulls a monoprint, like a red monoprint. He rollers on monoprint ink and pulls a print off those plexiglass things. So it's just actually one of my favorite artworks of the recent past. and. Uh, I wanted to pay tribute to it, and I also thought it would be really funny mm. to have it be like a hand-drawn um, graphite, black and white version of a, a red monoprint. So that's viewing panel by Aaron Gemmel. So just to give you a little bit of the logic of how the publication uh, came into being and how I built it. So I, I, I wanted to do it uh, really big, like a it's a broadsheet size, 22 by 30 to reference kind of the 19th century use of broadsheets and also to make it a big awkward uh, object that gentrifiers would have to kind of, you know, read in public somehow. Um, but I also wanted it to be super collectible and very refined and all these different things. So uh, this is sort of midway through uh, the East Coast edition um, when I was laying out the various pieces and um, putting in um, the various texts. So, um, as you can see, like I, that's the layout of the from the editor piece with a bit of clip art and condo report report is down there. The ads on the bottom um, are all I do sort of the opposite of what normal publications do with my advertisements. So I just give away ads or steal ads, and then they're always for whatever I feel like would be the underlying groups that were supporting this publication. So this is uh, uh, Black Women Artists for Black Lives Matter on the left. Uh, this what was the hipster book that N Plus One published, uh, UNTER, <laughs> my, my own organization, UNTER. And then um, uh, Crown Heights Tenant Union, I was living in Crown Heights at the time and a group called Gentrifiers Anonymous, which gets together to talk about gentrification. And then another kind of anarchist uh, group called Rent is Theft, which is a, opposed to rent overall. So um, yeah, but as you can see, it's organized like a regular uh, publication with, you know, the mass or the, whatever that's called, the, the top part, um, and then the, the page. And I, and I guess part of this was to make a joke about fine print and legal contracts and things like that. So the print was all very, very small, very fine. Here's another photo where you can see like, you know, my uh, primitive graphic design methods. 
and how I'm laying out the articles as they come in. Um, certain things didn't come in, like Ben Davis never turned in his sheet, neither did Will Smith. Like there were these different people who were going to write for it, it didn't happen. So things got changed around. Um, and as you can see at the top of this slide, um, I did, uh, this is the East Coast edition. So this was focusing hyper-locally on particular neighborhoods in Brooklyn and specific events in those neighborhoods. So every writer had uh, the neighborhood that they were reporting from following their name. And this is a scan of how the uh, final uh, pencil version turned out. So then, um, like I said, I originally sort of thought I would have a more of a sketch to then give to a letterpress person who would then make a letterpress print, but at a certain point I realized that the, that the actual handwritten version would be better. So I did a, um, it was a, a polymer plate from a digital scan of, of my hand-drawn version, and then that's what um, was used to, to print the final publication. And uh, just to give you an idea of some of the content, um, we had Christopher Glasek, who's a writer some of you might know. He writes for the New York Times. He wrote that great piece, um, The Art World's Patron Satan, about um, Stefan Schlumkowitz, the guy who's kind of always uh, investing, in young, investing in young artists. Um, so Chris Glasek, uh, I said he wonders if artisanal is just a crafty term for white laziness. So that's the WPT question mark piece for white people's time, which was about how um, in these kind of artisanal cafe type situations, um, waiting longer for the coffee signifies greater quality of the coffee and greater artisanalness. But it's not clear that there's a real relationship between like time spent making the coffee and and the coffee, but of course white people can pull that off and make it more valuable. Whereas if people of color would make a slowly make a coffee, that would become a problem, I think, for the customers. Um, and that was actually a, a Facebook comment. <laughs> people always ask, how did you get Chris Glasek to write? Uh, it was a Facebook comment that he wrote like two years ago, and I remembered. <laughs> I, I wrote it back, and I was like, "Can I can I turn that into an article for the Daily Gentrifier?" And he was very happy to to contribute. Um, Ayana Moore questions the label Gentrifier as as applies to a queer black woman. So it's the piece Gentrifier won't do in the second column on the top there, where uh, Ayana is is saying, "Well, you know, so she's a professor, an art an art professor, as it turns out, and she's living in a predominantly Latino neighborhood, um, and she makes more money than a lot of her neighbors, but she doesn't feel like gentrifier is exactly the right word for her, so what would be the word for her? So that's that, kind of like an op-ed type piece. Um, Alexander Dwinnell reports on ice raids and worker resistance at Tomcat Bakery in Long Island City. So um, Alexander has been really involved with um, some of the resistance to deportation attempts. You know the. Trump administration is really going after um, uh, especially immigration activists. So um, Alexander's been working on activism related to that. And he did a whole report on uh, the Tomcat Bakery strike that happened when um, basically ICE came to the bakery and made all these threats to Tomcat. And then Tomcat just said that they were going to fire everyone who couldn't produce a passport. Um, and um, the workers fought back. It was incredibly difficult, and they uh, got, I think they got like a slightly improved severance pay, but it was still a very brutal situation uh, that was instigated by ICE. Uh, so I just wanted to link also like some of the real estate things and what's happening with artists in these neighborhoods to the nastiest part of how this works, which is when, you know, the government sends in uh, police basically to, 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 to clear out work situations and um, neighborhoods, entire neighborhoods. 
Um, then William Pauhaida reports on Artist Studio Affordability Project's long-term advocacy for the Small Business Job Survival Act, as spearheaded by Jenny Dubnow. So that's ASAP presses for SBJSA, which I love as a kind of acronymic uh, cluster. Um, but that's a really important piece because actually it talks about how um, this is a group, Artist Studio, Studio Affordability Project, works together with uh, the tries to form alliances between artists and communities that are going to be displaced around uh, shared interests like um, industrial space rental and lease terms and things like that. So in New York, they've been really pressing for um, better longer term leases and setting uh, rent increase rates and things like that. So clusters of businesses can stay together and not get moved out as quickly. Um, and needless to say, that's like extremely boring work where you have to constantly be calling city council members and pressing them and trying to get artists to care about this, which artists don't care about that kind of thing without a lot of, you know, constant contact and TLC on the organizing end. So Jenny does great stuff with that. And it, it seems like this SPJSA is finally pressing forward. But um, things involved that actually at the Brooklyn Museum, we were protesting that like that when they had the, the Brooklyn Museum hosted a real estate, you know, they host all these things uh, where they rent out the museum, but they hosted this real estate developers gala. And so we, naturally, we appeared to protest that um, because you know, one doesn't want arts organizations to be you know, working with the developers to displace everyone. Um, then Aruna D'Souza, a great art writer, uh, reviewed Hilton Alls' Alice Neal Uptown show at David's Warner. So um, I don't know if you've heard about this show, but it was a show that Hilton Alls, the, uh, the theater critic uh, uh, extraordinaire, uh, organized around Alice Neal's work that she did when she moved up to Harlem and it was a lot of work that people hadn't actually seen and isn't featured in the many books uh, about Alice Neal, uh, which was largely portraits of people of color that she was meeting with and interacting with in, in Harlem. So uh, that was an interesting show and interesting, you know, partly in terms of what's happening uh, with Harlem now and how art galleries are playing a role in the further gentrification of Harlem. Uh, Justin Lieberman interviews Aaron Gemmel about his project Condo Report, which I told you about. Um, and then I myself wrote a piece about uh, Torquasi Dyson, uh, who actually has a show up at the Drawing Center now in New York, uh, Torquasi's uh, re real estate journey to Jersey, which actually started off as a report about how Torquasi had to move from Crown Heights back to Fort Greene because her landlord like rented her place out from under her, basically, and she was so shocked that she was, Torquasi's black, she was like shocked that she was moving back to Fort Greene because the tide was like going this way and so she moved back to Fort Greene. So it started off as a kind of miracle piece like Torquasi got this place in Fort Greene and she was living with this uh, family that really liked her and all that stuff. And of course, as all real estate situations in New York, it really went, went all wrong. And uh, so I called Torquasi one day to like get the update and she was like, oh yeah, I'm in Jersey City now. So that's that. That's that piece there at the bottom, Ricochet Love. So uh, yes. So and of course, you know, as happens in newspapers, all these things kind of cross pollinate and sit together in this kind of uh, collage style, which I thought was a uh, a good reflection of New York uh, kind of space and uh, real estate. And then on the back, so this, this, these two editions, the two coastal editions were printed back to back uh, because I wanted to have, on the one hand, a really hyper local kind of way of dealing with it, but then on the other hand, I wanted to show that this thing was happening in different places at the same time. So, uh, and they're both letter pressed together. So I like this idea of having like press, you know, the pressures of this kind of situation on both sides. Um, but as you can see, the West Coast edition, um, besides having like a different typographic character, um, it's also spatially organized in a way that was more reminiscent of LA. I didn't 
I thought about doing some kind of highway loops and things like that, but that was beyond what I could do. So it ended up being more just that it was airier and like less kind of you know clustered up than than New York. So um, yeah, so following a similar logic on the West Coast, um, the Daily Gentrifier talked about things in. Arlington Heights, Boyle Heights, Culver City. Can't read all these, but um, different different gentrifying neighborhoods in LA. And I had um, different um, LA staff to report on this. So Tracy Jean Rosenthal reported on the situation in Mariachi Square, where um, they recently put in a train system, and of course developers have moved in, and their uh, the rents are going up. Uh, uh, they're skyrocketing. So this was displacing a lot of the mariachis and the whole thing with Mariachi Square was that you could go to Mariachi Square and like get a mariachi band because they live there and everybody knew that and it was a whole kind of cultural organization around Mariachi Square but suddenly Mariachi Square became uh, very expensive. So in fact, this happened after I published but um, they had a tenants union and a rent strike and the rent strike went on for months and months, and they actually won the rent strike, and they didn't have to pay back rent. They got a lower rent increase. I think the rent increase went from like 50%, which of course like nobody can sustain a 50% rent increase. Think about your own situations. Like, could you suddenly pay 50% more? Probably not. Uh, to I think like a 6% increase or something like that. So it was a very significant victory. In LA, where it should be said, uh, resistance to gentrification has been more successful and more aggressive. Um, so that was Tracy Jean's piece at the top. I wanted to lead. A lot of times people think these things are just silly or something, so I always try to lead with something serious and substantial and fact-based so people understand that it's a, it's a, a real concern. Uh, Casey Park wrote a great piece. Uh, that excavates and exposes the settler roots of hipster fashion. So that's hipster settlerism in the middle there, um, which is a, is a great piece, really almost like the kind of anchor piece for the whole publication, which just points out how um, 19th century settler motifs um, are very precisely being cited by all the hipsters that gentrify neighborhoods. and. It's no accident, and also a lot of uh, native motifs like Navajo patterns and things like that are extremely hip in these gentrifying uh, situations. So she just says that's not accidental, that's like an actual thing. And um, she talks uh, at great length about how, uh, yeah, she, she makes too many good points to, to say all of them, but I'll say a couple of them. One of them was she said that. This is one of the only fashion trends ever that actually originates with white people, which is really funny and true. Uh, and she says, um, yeah, I think she says that, uh, I mean, I think one of the most important points is that, um, that we shouldn't pretend that this is some kind of like vague or accidental phenomenon. It's actually quite like specific and traceable. So. Everything from moccasins, dream catchers, Navajo patterns, all the animal executed animals on the walls, all these kind of references to 19th century pioneering. Um, and Nitan Shekhead explains why culture work was, uh, oh, it should say shouldn't scab, sorry. It's a typo, I apologize. Shouldn't scab on communities resisting gentrification. So that's uh, this piece, op ed, picking at that scab, uh, which relates to. Um, there's an organization called Defend Boyle Heights, which has uh, basically called a boycott of some of the galleries and nonprofits, arts organizations um, that moved into Boyle Heights, uh, partially encouraged by um, city ordinances that made it cheaper for them to move in, and they brought in police and things like that. So um, this this neighborhood organization called for a boycott of those. Um, profit spaces, which was very contentious, and a lot of people in the art world um, didn't really feel like observing that boycott. And uh, so, of course, when people set up what they were calling picket lines, 
a lot of people were saying, well, technically it's not a picket because this is not a union and there isn't a strike. And Nitsan just says, well, yes, technically it might not be that, but it is the same thing in the sense that a group of people trying to fight collectively for their survival is asking you to not participate in this tangential thing because it's related to their survival. So maybe it should be observed uh, with the same uh, uh, formality as a picket line. So that's the op-ed. Um, and to the right of that, um, so it's kind of hard to see on the screen, but this is uh, Daniel Spaulding, who some of you might know is a kind of leftist art historian who entertains himself and others by doing this thing called Social Practice Mafia, which is a series of internet memes that are related to like very insidery art historical and art critical issues. So um, did, I did the same thing I did with Aaron Gamble, where I offered to do a pencil rendition of his uh, very detailed internet meme, which is the, I forget, some of you guys are art historians, maybe you'll remember the, it's the image of, of the famous like 19th century painting of the guys working at the furnace. It's, uh, it's Menzel's Iron Rolling Mill. Thank you, Menzel's Iron Rolling Mill, yeah. that one. And on the top of it, uh, Daniel put like a bunch of kind of ironic uh, or satirical kind of meme comments like, wow, amazing space, the rent is okay if you split it eight ways. Uh, my friend Smyrner, some weird name, has this great project, but it needs 27 computers running Windows 95. Uh, and then at the end of the bottom, I think it says, um, why are there all these dudes here, though? <laughs> so, so this, of course, is about like this kind of ethic of like taking over some nonprofit space, and it's really cheap, but there are all these dudes here, and they're running old computers, and then uh, things kind of proceed from there. So that's that one. And then the bottom piece is um, Farrakhar Petian's report on the various proposals for the border wall with Mexico, which is, has since become even more controversial in the art world for reasons I don't want to go into. But um, uh, that's the bottom piece there where Farrah just pretty, pretty straightforwardly just talks about like what some of those proposals were, which you guys probably know included like one of the proposals included like 30 feet of nuclear waste being put by the border wall as a deterrent. Um, uh, another one of the proposals was made by an architecture firm that was like 80% Mexican American and they said they had done some soul searching and decided to still make a proposal which was kind of ludicrous. Um, some of them had solar panels as an attempt to like redeem the border wall. So anyways, pretty uh, ridiculous thing. So, as I said before, this was printed letterpress back to back um, in, an, in a first edition of 250. So that's a stack of 250 of them. And they're, they're quite thick and they can't be rolled, which makes mailing an adventure. And, um, but I wanted it to be this kind of awkward, stiff, conspicuous um, object. So that was part of the, the thinking behind that. And, Here's some of the language just to give you an idea in terms of how I present it. Designed, edited, and published by Dushko Petrovich, this crafty, hyper-local publication promises to give gentrifiers the refined, fine print about the goings-on in their up-and-coming neighborhoods, with one side focusing on New York and the other on Los Angeles. As Petrovich asks, asks his readers in From the Editor, do you sometimes feel an unease about your role in the real estate system? Do you feel the sense of unease is everywhere muffled? by an ostentatious ethic of local produce, sustainable design, and handcrafted everything. It's weird, right? It is weird, right? The two-sided broadsheet measures 22 by 30 and was completely hand-drawn before being digitally scanned and letterpress printed on double-thick, 160-pound Mohawk superfine white eggshell cover paper by Rona Press in Chicago. Uh, printed in addition of 250, the Daily Gentrifier will initially be available at cost, $40, but the price will go up $10 per month starting on October 1st. Get in while you can. So it currently costs $80, which is a disaster for sales, but <laughs> uh, that's part of the point. <laughs> but as with all rent situations, uh, you know, if you know the right people, 
You can get like a rent stabilized print or something. Um, so, you know, part of the publication obviously is a series of talks, including this one, where I go somewhere and, and bring up these issues and use the publication as a prop. Unfortunately, the, it arrived last night at 8 p.m., which was too late for, for it to be uh, received. So I don't have the prop today, but it is a, it does function as a prop. Um, and this was at the, um, the launch event at PS1 uh, in New York in September. Um, this was actually at uh, another organization called The Public School, but nothing to do with PS1. That's The Public School in Los Angeles, which is a kind of leftist open space for programming. And that's Casey Park reading her hipster settlerism piece there. Um, this was at an event at, at Farah's show, actually, uh, where we had a staff meeting to discuss like recent developments and things like that. So that's Tracy June Rosenthal and Farah Karpetian um, uh, reading, you know, side back to back publication. That was the first time they'd seen it. So. Um, this is Chris Wu, the famous designer, uh, being impressed with my design. I have a long running joke with Chris about doing a an internship at at Project Project, so this was submitted as my like design uh, application. That he was very impressed. He said the kerning was really wild. It's <laughs> <laughs> like hand hand kerned. Um, this is so the publication also enters different kinds of institutional spaces. This is uh, David Senior, who's the librarian at SF MoMA, uh, getting his copy. And SF MoMA has this section that Dominic Williston has organized called, now I'm going to figure out what it's called, the Public Knowledge Gallery, which is technically the 29th branch of the San Francisco Public Library, but it sits inside SF MoMA, which is really an extraordinary feat of museum policy negotiation because they don't charge entrance to that part of it and it follows all the rules of the san francisco public library so it's an attempt by some of the staff at sf moment to kind of do something different and more genuinely public within the museum so um the public knowledge gallery at sf moma is displaying uh, the west coast side they were like which side i was like well you're gonna put up the west coast side obviously <laughs> Uh, so the West Coast side is displayed at, at SF MoMA in the Public Knowledge Gallery. Uh, and that's me reading it at, at the Gentry, which is a genuine actual restaurant in Brooklyn. Um, and this is uh, the poet critic Raphael Rubenstein, who I ran into at Union Station and gave him one, so he's reading. Um, and Raphael's like a, you know, tallish human so um so the adjunct commuter weekly collapsed because the adjunct commuting staff couldn't sustain the you know the all the free work that adjunct commuter weekly required and uh genco uh, sorry the day of the gentrifier uh collapsed for different reasons which was that uh genco bought it and uh genco is this uh real estate invested company uh, who thought that the Daily Gentrifier would be a good marketing tool. So uh, when they took over, the rent uh, went up and I had to leave uh, the offices. So uh, the staff of the Daily Gentrifier is currently in exile, basically. It's similar to what happened later at DNA Info, actually, um, although it happened to us first. Um, and Gentco is actually just using the Daily Gentrifier um, as a marketing scheme to sell these um, gray t-shirts that have gentrifier written in them in various like university fonts. This is my Ohio State uh, <laughs> gentrifier t-shirt, or I should say it's, Gen it's Genco's uh, Ohio State t-shirt. So uh, one of the things in talking to the staff in exile uh, after we got bought out by Genco was that um, we felt like the hyper-local logic of the East Coast and West Coast editions could be expanded 
um, to cover other parts of the country, um, especially because as I get invited uh, to do different talks, including this one, uh, I often learn about whatever the current situation is in any given city. So um, we will be making the Columbus edition of the Daily Gentrifier Flyover Flyer, um, which will report on artists and art community interaction with these kinds of development and real estate questions uh, as they play out in Columbus, which will be a part of um, a series not limited to these, but starting with these um, that will report on Philadelphia, Nashville, uh, Detroit, and Chicago, in addition to uh, in, in addition to Columbus. So, um, you know, I was talking to Joey, and part of what I wanted to do in coming here was to hear from people here and to talk about how to make a publication um, connected to what's going on in Columbus, which would have the um, content and aesthetic characteristics that are appropriate to the situation in, in Columbus, which um, I'm a little bit further along in the Philadelphia one, so I can give you like a sort of preview of Philadelphia, which is that um, uh, Philadelphia puts its zoning ordinance announcements on these 11 by 17 bright orange um, sticker, like big stickers basically. So we're going to do, obviously, the flyover flyer for Philadelphia in 11 by 17 bright orange and some kind of printing technique that's similar to that. So all these things are going to play out in some way that's connected to uh, what the actual situation is, working with people who are in those actual situations. And I'll just be functioning as the editor and publisher of these, these various publications, which I mean, I guess my overall goal in all of this is to have, uh, have have people involved in those situations actually just be more reflective about what's happening and what they could be doing within it. Um, I don't think that artists can uh, stop gentrification necessarily, but uh, I'd like to see them try, or I'd be curious to see what happens if rather than kind of going along with it in this begrudging or unaware way, um, artists started to wonder like what their role is in, in development. I mean, I don't need to tell you guys, but um, artists in a certain sense play a crucial role because uh, artists are what make a neighborhood suddenly cool and suddenly accessible to other people with more money who come in later uh, and, and then get the benefits. So. Uh, artists are either the unwitting middlemen or henchmen of this kind of system, or they could be something else, which is, I think, to be determined. But I'm, I'm interested in what that, that something else could be. Um, yeah, so um, the daily gentrifier at gmail.com is my daily gentrifier email, or you could also email me at my name, or you could also uh, talk to me here. Uh, if you want to be involved, or if you think of someone else who might want to be involved, um, who's in Columbus, that would be great. So, am I taking questions? Okay, I'm taking questions. <laughs> you guys have to be giving the questions. <laughs> How did your move from being an adjunct to being the head of a MFA program uh, change your thinking? Is that part of the gentrification move? Or like, how did your economic situation, or at least employment situation, kind of affect some of yeah, this? Um, oh yeah, I guess I can't move away from the microphone. Um, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so with all the publications, I have a strict rule that you have to pertain to and identify as whatever the publications group is. So it's actually been hard to get people to admit that they're gentrifiers, because I think people try to keep it at arm's length, mm -hmm. but that's part of it. So uh, with Adjunct Commuter Weekly, I had to resign as, as editor um, as soon as I got a tenure track job. Um, so unofficially, Colleen Asper and Ted Minio have taken it over, but officially they haven't really, because Everyone's been really busy and whatever, but they are supposed to run 
uh, the daily or adjunct commuter weekly's website going forward. Uh, I didn't want the website to die. It's kind of in in hibernation right now. But um, Colleen and Ted, who contributed to the first issue, and I've worked with them a lot. Um, I think it could be good people to to take that forward. So I resigned from Adjunct Commuter Weekly. Um, but actually, I had already started this before we moved to Chicago and before I took that job. And it, it came, it actually came from the fact that um, the Daily Gentr, uh, I always mess, mix them up for some reason, they have like a kind of sonorous resemblance. Um, Adjunct Commuter Weekly uh, got a huge amount of press attention and I ended up having to do a lot of um, interviews and talks and different things in that in that character as the editor of Adjunct Commuter Weekly and I was like really happy to do that because obviously part of the whole project was to draw attention to the adjunct crisis in the in the US and, and actually worldwide. Um, but in those kinds of situations, um, in order for me to play that role, I really had to, um, there was kind of a halo that formed around me. You know, it was like a kind of, I'm the poor adjunct who has to do this, you know, and it was horrible and it is a huge problem. But on a personal level, I didn't really like that positioning that much. You know, it was okay like once or twice, but I had to keep giving interviews and keep taking up that position, um, which again, like I was happy to do it from a political point of view, but from a personal point of view, it just got tiring. And that I think started a kind of revolt in my own brain about, you know, how I was positioning myself and what the next thing would be. And I think I, I had thought that I would do Privacy Magazine next. But um, I was just walking around one day and I was like, yeah, gentrifier, like that's a much less comfortable and exciting thing to talk about. And um, if I want to make a publication about this and I want people to, you know, get down into the complexities and awkwardness and shame and all of it that is involved in these kind of situations, I had to be willing to say like, yeah, I'm a gentrifier, like I moved into Crown Heights because that's, I wanted to live in Brooklyn and that's what I could afford. So, you know, I moved to Crown Heights and that was the situation I was in. Um, so yeah, I, does that, I think that, that, that gets everyone up to date. So uh, I had already started the project actually before I went to Chicago but um, you'd be surprised how long it takes to like hand letter <laughs> <laughs> two sides of a 22 by 30 inch piece of paper and get all the typefaces right and all that stuff. So it just took a huge amount of time but before it was printed, yeah. But now, indeed, it's funny because now, now I'm like, re everyone's being nice to me here in Columbus because it's Columbus, but um, <laughs> I'm really on the hook in Chicago. Like everyone's like, Oh, hey, hey, Dushko, how, so when are you doing the Chicago Daily Gentrifier? Like, what's your problem? You know, they're like, <laughs> what is this New York, L.A. thing that you did? What is that? Why are you, why are you avoiding your own position in Chicago? Or why are you avoiding Chicago? Or why are you avoiding the Midwest? This kind of stuff. Like, people are really, you know, my friends, but they're like, you know, like Mark Fisher. I don't know if you guys know Mark Fisher. So Mark Fisher does public collectors and um, temporary services and stuff, you know. So Mark's like a good friend and stuff like that. Mark's always like, you know, when are you doing that Chicago one? And I'm like, I'm doing it. I'm working on it. Mark. I'm just, I'm just slow. So you know, that's part of that was part of you know doing. I I thought like at first I thought well okay I'll do Chicago but then I was like it's you know I could do I could do other ones. They they're gonna be smaller because I just can't do the whole broadsheet thing again like it was just too much and people ask me like do you really like this kind of meticulous mind-numbing <laughs> like, no I do not I do not like it <laughs> you know, I'm not one of these artists who like has to really enjoy the studio experience or whatever so I do it but I'm not gonna do it again so 
these are going to be like different, differently hyper, hyper artisanal. Yes. I'm curious about in the Columbus edition how, um, you know, this is like CC. I'm I'm trying to figure out how to say this right because I'm employed here. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But like CCAD's participation in gentrification or other you know Columbus institutions, um, Greater Columbus Art Council. Um, you know, um, it's this is a really small town in a lot of ways, uh -huh, and in my yeah. experience, that there's not been much safe space for institutional critique. Uh-huh, uh -huh. And um, so I'm curious how you see that playing out in the Columbus. Well, and it, yeah, and it's kind of easy for me because I live in Chicago. Um, <laughs> but uh, it's, 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 it's a real thing, and I think the, the difficulty of, like, connecting these dots and um, having these conversations is that they are they are genuinely uncomfortable for people. Um, I went through a lot of that, and I still go through it with with Adjunct Commuter Weekly because that's a more direct kind of confrontation of the school and how schools are set up. Um, and I can I can imagine as soon as you said that that yes, there is a there's a particular dynamic too around a city like Columbus um, where the art world is is small, so you can't. You can't be like hanging out in the radical leftist part of the art world, you know, throwing bombs at the big like we did in Brooklyn. Like you go to the Brooklyn Museum and protest because whatever, you know, like no one at the Brooklyn Museum is going to feel whatever. And I'm not that worried about having a show at the Brooklyn Museum like right away. So it's fine, you know, like <laughs> so that once that space is good, Chicago is similar, like. Chicago is bigger than Columbus, but it's still like a pretty tightly knit arts community to the point where these kind of maneuvers become more awkward. Um, but I'm interested in that, and like that's part of why, you know, we have, we genuinely, it's sort of a joke, but again, it's sort of serious. We genuinely have staff meetings, uh, and that would be like a thing that you would talk about at a staff meeting, like, yeah, I'm really struggling with this because I work there, or, you know, I got a grant from them, and so I don't want to uh, be, you know, I have to be careful or I have to be politic about this. And, you know, what I like to, like, on the meta level about all these publishing projects is those kind of conversations actually reflect the kind of conversations that happen at other more serious or bigger publications. You know, like, people have conversations around who you can and cannot alienate at any particular point in time or where the... Where you know everyone always talks about the firewall between advertising and 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 editorial, but like they're one of the reasons people talk about the firewall so much is because the firewall is not totally functional. You know, like there's a a lot of leakage across that supposed firewall where people don't want to print things because they know where the money comes from or they know where the reputation comes from. That kind of thing. So. So yeah, I mean, I think it's a really good question. And also, I think it's a question around, like, if you're trying to, you know, and I know this firsthand, like, if you're trying to um, start something or start some kind of arts organization or start something where you're not going to make a lot of money, uh, one of the things you encounter is that you're in these kind of vulnerable rent situations. and you're in a lot of vulnerable working situations where people are taking risks to, to, to even do the work or to get together. So, yeah, I mean, that's a good good question, which will not be overlooked by the editorial staff. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Just wondering about the, um, the, the West Coast version. Did you show it in LA, like at, at beyond the public school? Or? I haven't, it's funny because, um, you know, these things are kind of catch as catch can, and I haven't, I mean, maybe actually because of this kind of question you're talking about, the, the touchiness of things, like, I haven't really approached galleries about it, um, partly because I'm sort of just hovering somewhere outside the gallery world right now, but um, partly because it's kind of a weird thing to pitch. Like, I it actually crossed my mind, there's a, there's a new interesting gallery in, in in bed called we buy gold so you might have heard about it like it's an interesting gallery it shows a lot of my friends 
I like what they're showing, right? Space, mostly, at least the first couple of shows that I followed um, was mostly black artists. I was totally into it. And at one point I was like, oh yeah, Tarquasi's in the thing and maybe I'll, and then I was like, God, that's gonna be a weird phone call to make. Like, do you wanna show the Daily Gentrifier at We Buy Gold? Like, do you wanna talk about this? Do you wanna have this thing there that does that? You know, and I, I, I didn't do it maybe because I was busy or maybe because it was too weird. So the places that I've done some things with it in LA was, the Von Lintel Gallery, which is where Pharaoh was having her show. But it was randomly because Pharaoh was on staff and Pharaoh had designed, I'll go back to that. Pharaoh had designed this table that you see down there as part of it. So she's mainly a photographer, so the photos were on the wall, but she had also designed this spiral like colored glass table where she was inviting people to have conversations. This was like part of the show. so. Um, I was looking for a venue to have some events and she said, well, I'll host you at my show to have this conversation. But we actually decided with that one to just do the staff, partly because things actually had gotten so heated in, in, in LA, um, around Laura Owens and all this different stuff that, and, and I didn't know all my staff actually, like I didn't know Tracy, someone recommended her we worked out the piece and we did it, but people weren't totally sure of like how the piece was gonna read and stuff and like, um, yeah, like how it would fly in LA. So they, they, were, they were feeling some trepidation and I just thought like it'd be better to have a staff meeting and talk about all these things, cause, partly because I'm not in LA. So I was curious. Um, so that was that event. And then, um, where's public school? I think that's before, right? Public school was actually more recent, um, which is in Chinatown, incidentally. Um, but Chinatown LA is not currently, uh, as far as I know, a site of much tension around gentrification because a lot of the galleries left and it just kind of hasn't been that heated. Although it has started to be more heated in Chinatown in New York um, around the um, Omer Fast. Yeah, Omer Fast show and all that stuff. So, um, you know, it's interesting also like when these things kind of heat up and um, what comes up. But no, you know, it's 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 also like I sometimes feel like galleries and institutions catch up to these things a little bit later. Like right now, I'm showing the Adjunct Commuter Weekly a lot, like showing it. Um, but it's like from t two and a half years ago or something. Um, and I'm, I'm also partly like, I'm not going to talk about that because I'm not the editor anymore. So I don't know what will happen. I haven't really pressed it. I mean, I think what I did do was that I made wheat paste versions, so it's going to be wheat pasted um, because at a certain point I realized like it needs more public, uh, public reception. So, and there's a website, but I mean, you know, the wheat pasting is better because it like is in the neighborhood uh, where things are going on. So. And it's also part of the like, uh, what do you call it, broadsheet kind of tradition is the public display of news. Yeah. Another question. Um, just curious about the other Midwestern cities um, and what kind of associations or who are you associating with the bit other the cool did someone invite you already? Is it in the, at the school? Yeah, so it's, um, let me see here. Um, I'll go forward to it. Um, you know, each of, each of these has been sort of generated uh, on different terms and like kind of on their own terms. Um, and, you know, I, th I you know, it, it, could, it should be said to like, you could just as easily have Pittsburgh and, uh, Cleveland or what you know so some of this is arbitrary and I may eventually do uh, versions for those cities but um, just to go down through the list like uh, part of what happened with Philadelphia was that Aaron Gemmel who was in the New York one moved to Philly and then I got invited to uh, Ulysses that bookstore that it's like a art focused bookstore there um, 
to give a talk about Adjunct Commuter Weekly, and I was kind of like, okay, that's fine, but I want to be talking to people about this other thing. So um, when I was there, uh, it's not totally clear, but I was staying with Anthony Elms, who's the director of the ICA of Philadelphia, and Anthony was kind of, I think just as Anthony, but not as the director of ICA Philadelphia, helping me uh, kind of arrange some things. So I don't think ICA Philly will produce it, but some of those people are involved. Uh, I think I'm, I think I can say that. Um, so that one is like at this point just pretty ad hoc. Like Aaron, me, Anthony, and Jenny Shanker, who worked on or didn't work on Adjunct Commuter, but was like a big proponent of it are kind of starting to organize the Philadelphia one and uh, Aaron runs like a pretty good print shop type thing that he's setting up so I think Aaron's gonna print it um, Nashville I was I was asked to go out to Nashville uh, with my wife Magdalena Moskalevich the artist and curator um, for this thing called locate arts which is like a Tennessee wide thing where they bring in speakers and we did the thing where you do studio visits and all that kind of stuff and one of the places we went was um, I'm gonna forget the name it's a letterpress studio and Nashville has this great tradition of letterpress because of hat show print and um, the Grand Ole Opry and stuff like that so they have a huge tradition of like musical uh, posters and so I visited one of those guys in Pie Town which is a gentrifying neighborhood in Nashville, and he had kind of an activist letterpress thing going, so um, I'm gonna try to work with him in Nashville to put together something around Pie Town. Uh, and then Columbus with, with you guys and whoever wants to be involved. Um, Detroit, I got asked by this group called Essaid, which is... Um, they were here. They were here, okay, yeah. So I'm doing a... Um, uh, like a publication workshop with them in April and um, again it was like this thing where I'm kind of like well if I'm gonna go somewhere and do a talk I'd like to like learn some things and meet with some people and so I'm gonna meet with people have been sending me their Detroit recommendations and stuff like that so I'm gonna maybe not work with SA but just use that as a an excuse to kind of hunt around for what's going on because I have a lot of friends who are actually like former Detroiters like Steve Locke and uh, Michael Miller who have both kind of written about what's happening in Detroit so um, either them or some some other people are going to be involved with that um, and then to be honest Chicago is the like the one I've thought least about because I'm there and but I, I, I'm, I think I'm going to try to turn the tables on Mark Fisher and have him be involved because he's really been pressing on it and like he's always like you live in Logan Square but he lives in Avondale it's gentrifying too so I'm really excited to excited to like rope Mark into but he doesn't know that yet <laughs> so I don't know um, yeah and in all of them I mean I guess I should say this more explicitly like it's a combination of maybe writer printer designer depending on who's available and I'm I'm versatile so I like I design this like uh, but I'm not like an official designer so depending on what's going on and who wants to be on the team then that'll kind of determine uh, who, who, I, who I work with so what's yeah. the font uh, the second song flyover flyer you know I don't know but I wrote it down I'll, I'll tell you I'm terrible I mean I just you know I'm really good friends with Prem Krishnamurthy, who was like one of the great designers of our time. So, in the way that that makes you lazy, I'm lazy. Like I just call Prem and ask him things, or something. You know, like he solves my problems. He did. Prem did. Uh, uh, Prem did that so, mm -hmm. as a gift, and then he invited me. <laughs> he invited me to. Did you? He did this alphabet show. So he invited me to make a work for the alphabet show. So I printed a huge, I was, he gave me the letter D. So I just printed up his own work on a big vinyl thing <laughs> and brought it in. And Prem is like super meta, whatever, interactive, something, something. So I actually thought he would love it. 
and he was so disappointed in me. <laughs> <laughs> he was like, yeah, I'll put it up. Yeah. How would you um, proceed from here for Columbus? What kind of, uh, what have you heard about Columbus in terms of the situation? Here? What people have said to me is Fourth Street. I uh, heard some stories about being kicked out of places. Um, you know, what I remember, so this is the bad thing. Like, I come to Columbus and see my family and go back. You know, like, I, that's, I, I don't, like, study Columbus's gentrification. I haven't yet, right? I obviously will. Um, but what I remember was the kind of push from OSU. This is, like, in the you know, early mid nineties, OSU pushing to make high street. So kind of corporate and, um, it's now called an arts district, an arts district. Right. But it used to be a genuine arts district in the sense mm -hmm. that it was like nasty bars with music in them and everyone going there with their fake IDs. And, you know, mm -hmm. like that was like the nineties too was like the great, uh, or a great era of Ohio music. So it was like, Afghan wigs and guided by voices and Thomas Jefferson slave apartments and I don't know all those bands were playing there and it wasn't like aesthetic in in, in, in any marketable sense or whatever but it was really aesthetic you know generating a lot of culture so you know I guess because my of my limited you know, interaction with Columbus, which involves all like high to main to mound, you know, or being on 70 or whatever. Um, that's kind of what I remember. So I'm kind of curious to like dig into some of this stuff that's happened around Ohio State, short north, like that whole kind of corridor. Um, and, you know, hear from, for example, from local arts organizations and groups who've tried to like open stuff and see how it played out. Um, I want to find out, you know, we're, we're at the beginning, so it's like, it's just like figuring out things to research, but like, what are the tenant organizations? Like, what are the small business organizations? Do artists participate in any of that? Like, uh, all that kind of stuff. So, um, I do a lot of this really based on like person to, you know, I do like some book and whatever research, but then a lot of the research method is like interviewing and talking to people and things like that. So I'm hoping maybe some of you guys uh, will be interested in talking about it and, um, you know, emailing and phone calling and going around, you know, come back to Columbus and, you know, see things and talk about things um, to figure out like also like what's the key thing about it. Like in LA, like a lot of it hinges on Boyle Heights and how people are handling the Boyle Heights thing, like that's become very heated and like a kind of center clash point. New York is like way more diffuse and like different things are happening in different places. So, uh, you know, they're just different kind of uh, issues to track in each place. So I guess that's a way of saying like, I can't necessarily predict yet what the, what the Columbus version will be like. It's sort of depends on what people tell me is the key thing, you know. Yeah. As we speak now, there's a gallery hop happening on, um, in the short north with the few galleries and mostly boutiques and restaurants. Right, right. This woman, first Saturday. Right, the first Saturday. Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. the first Saturday. Yeah. yeah. That's why they're not here. I see. That's <laughs> no, but I'm, like, I'm, I was telling Joey, like, I'm totally punk, like, if there's more people in the audience than on stage, then it's a huge success, and <laughs> then when you're, when you're just a one-person punk band, then it's, like, very easy to achieve that <laughs> situation, but I genuinely wouldn't mind talking to one person, I do it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Oh, they'll know about us later. <laughs> when the flyover flyer hits, it'll be difficult to ignore. <laughs> <laughs>
There's a really contested neighborhood right now called Franklinton that the city is really participating in the development of, and there's just a lot of layers there. There's a space that's been there for a while called 400 West Rich that people think is an artist-run space, but it's actually run by a venture capitalist who lives in California. Oh, now we're talking. <laughs> I've got a lot, so I'll email yeah. you. <laughs> I'm excited to hear, yeah. So, yeah, the Daily Gentrifier at, uh, at Gmail. You could also probably uh, talk to Joey, and Joey will get you to me, um, uh, or Dushko Petrovich at Gmail, or, you know, I'm like everybody, I have like 17 email addresses now, like at SAIC I have an email, so, yeah, yeah, be in touch, and, you know, I should say, like, so one of my, one of the, what's the plural of ethos, ethoses? <laughs> One of my ethos is, an aspect of my ethos is that everybody who participates in the publication identifies with the demographic for that publication. But another one is that everybody who wants to participate can participate. So we also do that with the paper monument books and stuff like that. Like if you submit, you're in. Like there's no uh, exclusion and you know, I'm into things too that question the whole, the whole project or, you know, want to talk about it from a different angle or, you know, like that piece Ayana wrote was like, came out of a dinner conversation where she was like, I don't even like the term gentrifier, like, I reject that, so, okay, so perfect, so then she wrote for it, you know, so, yeah. Well, thank you so much. Cool, yeah, thank you.